welcome to the Bumblecast. I'm your host, Ian Flynn, the Bumble King, and joining me as always is that man who chooses his own fate, Kyle, JCRB Krause. I choose you, somebody. I don't know where this is going, Ian. I don't know anything. Um, it is a slow and awkward transition to our main topic. But before we get to that, how are you, sir? <laughs> I'm doing okay. How are you doing? I am super busy. Yeah, I, I know that feeling. I've got a bajillion things going on right now, and I kind of forgot that I had a bajillion things and spent way too long on Death Stranding. And then <laughs> looked at my to-do list and went, oh, whoops. And then emails started coming in, and it's like, oh, whoops. <laughs> And then you reminded me last night that the new Star Wars is coming out. And it's like, oh, <laughs> whoops. And then Leah says, we haven't finished our Christmas shopping. It's like, wait, it's December. Oh, whoops. <laughs> so um, I, what's funny is I didn't even really realize Star Wars was coming out until I looked it up myself right before I messaged you. And I, I wasn't even looking that up specifically. I was just looking at our calendar. And I saw that on I there. Mean, I'm the, like, uh, oh, the, maybe we should. The tie-ins and the ads are this. everywhere, but. Are they? I haven't been paying attention. <laughs> well, that's the thing. I know they've been on, but I haven't been paying attention to them. It's like, huh, a lot of Star Wars stuff lately. I guess it's because of the Mandalorian. No, wait, it's the major <laughs> tent pole in the franchise. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Which, at this rate, is most likely just going to be Return of the Jedi 2.0, but we'll see. We'll see. Yeah, uh, yeah. Hmm. I don't know how interested. <laughs> Here's kind of the thing: my interest is falling off precipitously. Is that a word? Yeah. Is that, the way, is that the is that the correct way to pronounce that word? I think it is. I believe so. Yes. Yeah, I think I did it. I did it. Like anyway, I, yes. it's not like I disliked the last two films. I enjoyed them. Yeah. The f- uh, first one is super fun. It's just a new hope again, yeah. with an interesting cast, but they're not really utilized. And then the second one, we had a whole bumble cast about that and my issues with the structure and whatnot but i still enjoyed elements of it so it's not like i'm dragging my feet to see the third one i do kind of want to see where things go sure but it's not the same kind of fervor i had when phantom menace came out Mm. yeah it's just like kind of like okay well now i feel kind of obligated to see it in a way more than anything else (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> of course, I'm kind of the same way with a lot of the Marvel films. It's like, oh, well, I guess I better watch it so I understand the rest. In a sense, in a sense, yeah. Although I'm really excited for Black Widow, which just the trailer just dropped for that. I'm excited for that because I've been wanting a Black Widow movie for over 10 years now or longer. Mm-hmm. <laughs> However long it's been since she's existed and I've known about her existence. Yeah, it's probably about right. But yeah, I'm looking forward to that, even though uh, I'm... I'm a little disappointed that it's going to be like a prequel kind of deal that's obviously because, uh, you know, spoilers for uh, Endgame, but, you know, mm-hmm. she's kind of gone now. So <laughs> we have to do a back in time movie, not far back, but, you know, after Which Civil, War, after Civil uh, War. Yeah. Which folks are speculating are setting up her equivalent replacement for the next phase. Uh, I don't know why they'd kill her off to begin with. It's a dumb idea. So, anyway, uh, I had a pretty good Thanksgiving down here, Ian. I know you didn't have uh, you didn't have any Thanksgiving celebrations, as far as I'm aware. Well, we had ours well, in the you, traditional you, Canadian. You, you had the Can- yes, you had your Canadian Thanksgiving. You did not have the more recent. Uh, November American Thanksgiving. No, things were very, very uh, hectic up here for family reasons that I won't get into. But at this point, things are good. We're out of the woods, at least in some respects. So <laughs> primo news there. Just That's good. It, that whole week was kind of like, OK, we're just going to get through this day by day, aren't we? Yes, we are. <laughs> Head down. Hope for the best. Right. Oh, I actually saw some snow for my Thanksgiving. Well, a couple days after, but... Um, e gad, man! <laughs> I know! I had to drive an hour and a half, actually almost two hours, out of the city to do it, but I did it! <laughs> <laughs> uh, my uh, my father actually just recently moved up uh, north, of, north of me a couple hours into the mountains, so I went up there for the Thanksgiving weekend, and... 
yeah, there's a couple inches of snow on the ground up there, and it was. Yeah, but uh, the mountains are cheating. Mountains was, get snow. I know, but it was thir- and it was 32 degrees. It was freezing in the middle of the day. I'm like, wow, this is different. Down here, <laughs> down here where I am right now in Phoenix, it's currently like 75, and it's, and it's really humid and it's gross. No. It's gross. Absolutely not. It's gross. It's like, well, I, I mean, gnaw my own leg off. I mean, okay, it's only forty percent humidity, which for you is probably like super dry, but for us, that's like super duper humid. So mm-hmm. yeah, it's mm-hmm. pretty rough, mm-hmm. but mm-hmm. yeah, it's pretty cool. I got to see some snow, so I'm interested in what Christmas is going to be like if I'm going to even be up there. We were a little worried that uh, there might have been too much snow on the ground for me to even get up there, but it wasn't a problem. So. That is a legit concern. Um, as yeah. someone who does have a set of snow tires that I swap into for this season, they do make a world of difference. Even if it's just um, mostly clear slushy city streets, they are, I I cannot imagine driving without them. Right. You know, everyone laughed about in Charlotte, you know, we get an inch of snow and everyone is driving like they're pedaling, but we don't have the proper tires over there. Right. Any yeah. amount of snow is dangerous. So mm-hmm. if you are driving out into the snowy mountains for Christmas, do be careful. Yeah. Uh, well, we'll see how the how it is. Because it may be just like, no, no snow. Never mind. <laughs> Big snowstorm hit in the end of November and then nothing. It's done. So anyway, are we done talking about the weather? <laughs> <laughs> you know when the show's running dry when we're talking about the weather. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so our topic today is another patron topic, is it not? Uh no, this is actually my suggestion. I'm 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 a patron of this show, Ian. I'm I patronize you all the time. <laughs> I think. Well, you Let make the show run, so you know your patronage is appreciated. Okay, good. I don't know what this means. What anyway? Yes, I suggested this topic. <laughs> uh, this is balancing plot-driven versus character-driven stories. I don't know why necessarily I wanted to talk about this. It's just interesting. Um, well, it, it is. It's a very interesting approach to how you're constructing your narrative. Right. And I mean, you have things like character studies where you mostly focus on a character or characters and their interactions with each other rather than like an overall overarching narrative, like a, you know, where there's conflict and stuff, you know, where you're just kind of like, maybe it's like an in the day of, in the life of your character versus, uh, you know, just throwing them into a situation that's more plot driven. Mm. It, 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 but it's it can be tough to kind of balance that, which I think is, um, which I think is interesting, and I'm wondering how you handle um, stuff like that. Uh, it personally, I gravitate more towards plot driven stories, in so far as I like to know where th- things are going. Right. Like from the way I construct stories, I want to know what the beginning, middle, and end are and how to reach those points. And then when I apply the characters to it, I adjust from there. Like if I know the character is going from point A to point B to point C, but they get to point B in a way that just does not make sense for them. Why would they choose to do that? If I'm spending too much time making them come to this decision, I have to step back and go... Mm, maybe I need to change course here because that ain't working. And they can still get to point C. It's just I have to figure out how they would get there. Um, there's a big like there's a big divide in how you approach it depending on the you know material. Like with Drogoon, that is terrifying because it's all me. Sure, I am establishing the path and where it's going to go, and kind of discovering these characters as I do more with them. So it's a lot more experimental. And I feel like that's where the plot driven structure is helping me because it gives me some guidelines to follow and allows me to put these characters into scenarios going, okay, does this make sense? Especially what has come before. And there have been entire scenes that I've just completely rewritten or chucked because it's like, nope, that just doesn't work. That's where I want to go that way, but I can't. The characters that I've created would not do that or wouldn't head in that direction 
or I'm trying too hard to make them go that way. Mm-hmm. Whereas with Mega Man, that by design had to be a plot driven book because it was an adaptation of the games. Sure. It yeah. was the game plot. Right. And the characters had to hit those points. So that was maybe one of the bigger hurdles in Mega Man was going, okay, these plot points have to happen. We had a little bit of wiggle room here and there because it wasn't you know, a 100% faithful adaptation all the time. But it, I tried to skew as closely as possible as I could to the games. So how does it make sense for these characters to do this? And if they're showing any kind of growth, how do you reconcile that? You know, everyone jokes about the revolving door of Wily, but when you have an innocent like Rock being put into these very non-innocent scenarios, how does one deal with that? Right. Um, with the Sonic books, those were mostly plot driven in that you need to have something contained for marketing purposes with the trades, especially later on in my work, but also to kind of give them consumable moments to make it easier to follow and easier to jump in. Mm -hmm. With the old run, it was such a long series, and there were so many twists and turns to the story. I felt like we needed to have these easily identifiable storylines that you can pick up at any point and have a starting and end point. You know, you can some place where you can tell someone, okay, this is the story you need to understand to get to this point, or you're jumping in at any given point. Well, this narrative by itself makes enough sense. And hopefully you're intrigued enough to go back and read what came before or stick on to see what the next storyline is. Mm -hmm. Um, But with any licensed book, and this applies more to Sonic than anything else I've worked on. The licensor and the editors are, you know, these influences to both help and hinder when it comes to telling a story. And sometimes it, it didn't quite mesh. Um, I guess that one of the best examples would be uh, House of Cards, probably the most maligned story I wrote. <laughs> and the pitch for this for the story arc was supposed to be another large arc. It was supposed to be uh, in studying the characters in this division of political mentalities, and it was supposed to be much more character driven and thoughtful while the main plot point was Amadeus leading the reformation and Elias sticking to his guns because he didn't know what else to do. But the editor stepped in and said, no, we want to move on quickly from this. You got two issues. (laughs) Also, we really want to market it. So it has to be Sonic versus tails. So what I had to do was look at what was in the narrative and kind of skew things, dial things up a bit. There was, enough drama from previous issues that it wasn't completely baseless, but there were a little bit of mental gymnastics to make that fight happen. So that I don't feel was the best result. I did the best I could. Right. And then you have stuff like with the current run of the books where, you know, some folks were not completely satisfied with certain characters, characterization. And it's like, I agree, but (laughs) hands are tied so do the best that i can and in that regard you just kind of hope that the strength of the plot will carry you on through that speed bump so you can enjoy the whole arc even if maybe one particular moment was not as mm, as it could have been sure yeah and i feel like there's a lot of constraints in modern media like even comic books, stuff like that, TV shows and movies and stuff. We only have so much time, so getting into a... Doing a deep dive into characters is a little tough to do and is not... Sadly, not very interesting to most people, I guess. Like, it, I guess mm-hmm. it depends on the strength of the character. Uh, if they are interested in that sort of deep dive into them, but I think most people kind of want something to happen which i feel is kind of a shame because i think if if stuff could just slow down a little bit and we have a little bit more time with the characters and maybe not just have like oh the world's ending constantly all the time (laughs) 
we have to right, go save right, it. Right. Maybe maybe slow down a little bit. Maybe we could have you know. I feel like there's a more balance to be had there than there is than there's allowed to be in sort of the things we consume currently. So I get that personally. I prefer more narrative uh, plot driven media. And if we do have a character driven piece, I prefer that it is a segment that moves the story along sort of thing. Um, Gargoyles was a fantastic example of this where you would have episodes that focused on Brooklyn or Hudson or, you know, someone other than Goliath and they would be great character moments, but they still contributed to the overall world. Even if it was a small advancement, it was still part of the greater plot. Right. And then it feels like you still have that forward momentum. You're still going somewhere with everything. Right. Yeah, definitely. That's one thing that I appreciate is being able to mesh the characters with the plot and still be able to have something actually, you know, happening, but also, you know, do more of a deep dive into a character. Because I get, personally, I tend to get kind of attached to certain characters and I want to see more of them, even if it's just them doing something like kind of mundane (laughs) overall, like just kind of living, kind of living in a daily life for them. Um, you know, Black Widow in getting groceries. <laughs> Not necessarily like that silly, but you know, just doing something like uh, I don't know, just I don't, <laughs> I don't know how to describe what I'm thinking here. It's just kind of like a. I feel like there's more of a balance to be had there, though. I get you. You, you want to see moments where the characters are doing something that they would do not beholden to the plot. What do they do when you don't see them in the heat of the moment? Right. Or maybe something that could be part of the plot, but not necessarily like, Oh, this is a, this is something that needs to happen right now. And it's, it's like, Oh, if this doesn't happen, the plot's going to fall apart completely. And it's like, well, no, just something little. So yeah, something like that. So, and I do, I do. It's just cause I did like tend to get attached to characters and I like certain characters and, I just want to see more of them <laughs> a lot of the time. Now there's one, you just reminded me uh-huh. there was, there's this one particular issue of X-Men that I absolutely adore. And it is one of those moments that is very character driven and it doesn't really do anything for the overall plot. Cause it's kind of an epilogue issue, but that's also why I really love epilogue issues if I get the chance, because you don't need to move things along. You're just tying a bow on it, and you can have those character moments. Exactly. Uh, it was right at the end of Executioner's Song, which was this huge multi-title crossover event. And one of the main subplots is Xavier, who's got his legs working again for the issue, uh, kind of spends the evening hanging out with Jubilee. And this is back when Xavier was this kind of paragon figure who everyone was a little afraid of and had deep respect for and he didn't have quite the number of skeletons in his closet as he does now Mm -hmm. and jubilee was still the super young mall rat um bright-eyed youth kind of character not a single mom vampire but that's something that's entirely (laughs) whoa hey i have not kept up with x-men i didn't know that (laughs) (laughs) and it's this moment, you know, Xavier's got his legs back and he doesn't know how long, but he's enjoying the ability to walk again. And Jubilee kind of gulps and goes, well, you know, Professor, you haven't really lived until you tried rollerblading. And so they're careening around the <laughs> estate and he is absolutely terrified and she's having the time of her life. And he thanks her for, you know, a fun or at least interesting experience. And as he's walking away, he starts to stagger. Oh. And you know, this is somebody you don't approach really. And he, he, he is the professor. She is the super undergrad here. And she's thinking to herself, if there's anybody listening up there, please give him a break. Just give him the dignity to get across the lawn. And he can't quite make it. And she runs over to help him to his chair. And that stuck with me. That is this beautiful, poignant moment that you just wouldn't get in a big bombastic multi-part arc. And I love that issue. There's a lot of other good moments in that book, but oh, I don't remember which X-Men or which issue number it was, but 
Oh, I love that moment right there stuck out to me a lot. Yeah, that's a that's a really good one. I'm kind of interested in checking out that issue. There's another one too. Um, while we're talking character driven, it was an issue of X Factor, I think by Peter David. Oh man, I'm going to be embarrassed if I got that wrong. But basically, the entire team is psychoanalyzed, and you get these two or three pages of getting into the heads and the backstories of each individual character. And I read that thing until it fell apart, man. Oh, it was such a freaking engaging issue. Like up to that point, Quicksilver had just kind of been the fast jerk in the series. Not a whole lot of nuance to him, but as he's talking to the analyst, he's talking, he says, you know, Imagine you're out running errands and you get in line behind somebody who doesn't know how to use the ATM or you have to mail something. And the person is arguing with the person at the counter on how much the postage is and everything takes forever. This idiot is in your way as a speedster. Every in the, every person in the world is that to him. That's why he's always cranky. That's why he's always impatient. Everyone is just so slow. And it's like, huh? I can empathize with that. I totally get where you're coming from. Okie dokie. Yeah. <laughs> and it's accompanied with the uh, visualization of him, like doing a jigsaw puzzle in like record time, not even looking at it. Just bah, 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 bah. And just, mm, just all these really good moments. But the thing is that whole issue is pretty much that there is no forward momentum. There is nothing moving the greater story forward. So if you have these, If we're talking like a serialized piece of media, like television or like an episodic series or comics, I feel like you kind of need these uh, character moments here and there. Just a little bit of downtime. It's a break from the overall plot and to really dig into the meat. But you can't do it all the time because then it's, I don't know, personally, I need a sense of progression. Right. So I love these little individual moments, but you know, with that issue done, I need to see it go somewhere. Exactly. Well, yeah. And I don't disagree. I definitely do not disagree. Cause you know, just sitting around doing nothing gets really boring after a while. So, um, like one of the examples I'm thinking of off the top of my head, and this is kind of the obligatory Sonic example, but, um, this is actually even before you, uh, came on, to the book Ian but um, of course we got to talk about stargazing the, mm-hmm, uh, the mm-hmm, first mm-hmm. instance of Nicole actually uh, becoming the holo links and uh, how she just wants to see the stars with uh, with Sally and I feel like that's a very very uh, sweet character driven moment for both of them really and uh, of course you there was also the uh, you also revisited that uh, later on after the reboot and, right. uh, yeah, so, and that, it worked just as well there, too, so, um, but that's, like, the, a big example I can think of where it's just kind of, like, uh, all this time we spent, in the Sonic book, we spend a lot of time with plot kind of moving forward, and there's, there's character moments here and there, but there's not really, um, major downtime, because, you know, there's always a looming threat, <laughs> so it's kind of nice to have just a... Just even it's even just a few pages to just be like, okay, here's here's just these two characters. We're introducing a new incarnation of this character here. And we're just going to have a nice character driven uh moment between uh two people rather than, you know, going out all out with uh you know, crazy plot or having to introduce Nicole because um because of something like I don't know. She needs to go. She needs to be there to, to, uh, to fight something or something like that. Right. Uh, yeah. But also in that instance, stargazing was a backup story. So you had well, the lead yeah. story to do the narrative driving force, exactly. giving you that opportunity for stargazing. So exactly. That would kind of feel like we should have spent more time with the backup stories, doing the smaller character pieces and less, I don't know. Hindsight's twenty twenty. Sure. Yeah. But at the same time, you know, you do have plots that you want to hit, plot points that you want to hit, and things you want to get to. So 
I understand. Or in the case of uh, Darkest Storm, that had to be pretty much 98 condensed plot. 98 percent condensed <laughs> plot because there was so much to cover <laughs> oh my god yeah so but yeah that's one example i can think of where sh- that's just like a nice moment in the middle of like a mostly a, a plot driven uh storyline i don't know if there's anything else you wanted to add to this topic ian I i guess just in summation for anyone who is listening to these for any kind of insight or taking notes and for that i'm so sorry (laughs) but uh there is no right answer there you know plot driven is not inherently better than character driven or vice versa it all comes down to what you're doing with the project and if you are doing something that is plot driven which i prefer it gives you a nice structure to follow but you really have to look at your characters and say all right are they doing what they're doing because that's how they would react or are they doing it because the plot demands them to? And it always, always should be the former. Uh, if you're doing something that's character driven, that's great. But are you just doing like this monologue? Is this a bit of performance art? Or are you doing something with it? Is it how is the this information we're getting from the character informing the rest of the story? Is there a rest of the story? I don't know. It really depends on what you're doing with it. <laughs> right. Yep. How often do you like tinker with things just as like a just as a as a writer outside of, you know, doing it as your job? How often do you like do character studies or even things like that where you just like maybe write a character or I don't know, write a few lines of dialogue between two characters or whatever just to see how well, they interact and things like that? I as just kind of a test scenario, not too often, because usually when I'm tinkering with things, which is all the time. Well, yeah, I, 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 I don't sleep, Kyle. I <laughs> revise. <laughs> but um, it's, you know, taking these key scenes that are usually interactions between a couple of characters and taking another pass at it, at least in my head going, OK, how would they say it if. You know, now that I know what I know and we've reached this point, does do they still approach it the same way? Um, there's a scene in Drogoon in book two that I had in my head from pretty much the outset. I knew exactly what I wanted to do with this scene, what it would mean for everybody, and how it would play out. And the more I worked on the series, you know, going forward and getting book one done, and the more I thought about how I wanted these individual characters who were involved to be in the long term, the more and more I saw that this scene just didn't work. You know, the, the interactions were there, but they didn't inform us in a way that was necessarily the best approach. And if anything, the way that the scene was built was more distracting than anything. It was more built around this visual than it was on the characters. So I just chucked the entire thing. I've got like, five or six revisions of that one scene in different files and they're all garbage because what I settled on the, the core idea is still there, but the characterization and how these characters are presented and how the characters interact is much more focused on the individuals and what information I'm trying to convey and less about the visual setting, which I'd like to think is the right way to do it. Right. No, I think you. And that's another thing is plot or character when you're writing. I despise this phrase, but an editor taught it to me very early on, and he's right. Be prepared to kill your darlings. You may (laughs) have this. You have this idea that you built everything around. It's going to be great when you finally get there. It's going to be so kick ass. Yeah, this is what it was about. And you get there, and it's like this doesn't work. I've wanted this for so long, and it's just not going to work. And you gotta let it go and. (laughs) <laughs> I could probably cut my own spleen out and it would hurt less, but ugh, mm-hmm. you got to do it. You got to do what's <laughs> good for the story. <laughs> and here I was thinking like killing off characters. <laughs> like, Whoa. Hey, this is a bit extreme. <laughs> I mean, I guess it can apply in that situation as well, but <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Don't, don't kill off your characters for no reason, folks, unless they suck, then kill them. It's fine. But if they're a good character, <laughs> kill them off. Unless it's necessary for their story, I guess. But even still, come on. 
Uh, all right. I think we've uh, just about exhausted this topic, I think. Unless you've got anything else to add, Ian. I think that covers the basics at the very least. Yeah, sure. Are we ready to hop on into the Q&A? We are, we are. Now, if you want your question answered here on the show, you can tweet to us on Twitter at Bumblecast, email us at Bumblecast at Yahoo.com, comment on any of the YouTube videos. If you're a patron, ask it in the Discord channel specifically for the Q&A, or post us or message us or whatever on the Patreon. That's patreon.com backslash Bumblecast. Yep, and we've uh, we've got a few ground rules that we are uh, esta- going to be establishing uh, as we move forward and in, into the next year uh, as far as Q&A is concerned. So, um, But essentially, we're kind of looking to whittle down repeat questions or questions that are already on the FAQ or things that are related to uh, things that would be in like Lost Hedgehog Tales. So past Sonic plans. So if any, if you have any of those questions, it's pretty likely we won't be answering them. But if your question hasn't been answered in a while, go ahead and check the FAQ or uh, previous episodes and see if uh, see if it's there. Right, because we've got the FAQ and we have that's it's on BumbleKing.com. I've got a whole list of FAQs. So there's that. Uh, We've been talking about Lost Hedgehog Tales and what it will cover for five seasons now. And we list all the questions in all the episodes. We have done as much as we can to put that information out there so you can see if your question has been answered or not. And we can't quite do much more than that. So out of respect for our time and just out of common sense... If you haven't had your question answered in a while, give a quick look at those avenues and see what has and hasn't been answered. And if your question is, what would have happened in the book if, go ahead and I'll tell you right there. It's on the FAQ. It would have been Lost Hedgehog Tales. Can't answer it. So, sorry to put the foot down, but we've had some folks starting to get a little impatient over whether or not their question will be answered. And it's like, we have. Or... We have, yeah. <laughs> we've we've revisited it multiple times. We've talked about this, and we've talked about things like fan ideas and stuff. Where, like, you know, try not to submit your fan ideas because you know it, it's a it's a thing. It's a thing, Ian. It's a thing. And if you desperately need this question answered, you can buy your way to the front of the line for five dollars over on Patreon.com backslash Bumblecast. Or at coffee.com backslash Bumblecast. Correct. Yes. And uh, if you send us like five questions a day, uh, maybe don't expect to have your questions answered all that frequently. We try to work through them, but man, if you're sending that many a day, it's a, it's a lot. So uh, yeah, be, we, be aware. We're going to probably pick and choose. <laughs> And we're probably not going to pick very often, so sorry, but we have a lot of questions, and we don't want to, you know, we don't want to devote it to devote everything to one person. So sorry. Anyway, let's get into priority Q and A, shall we? Let's. All right. First question comes from Eggman Inc. In Sonic Universe number eighty-eight, it's stated that a catastrophic event blasted Pancardina into a series of islands with the trolls, Walter Nagus's race being all but wiped out overnight. What was this event, or what caused it? That was a plan that was going to be used in one of the older books. That's what we covered in The Lost Hedgehog Tales, <laughs> which is on indefinite hiatus. And ah! <laughs> Eggman, uh, Inc., you break my heart. You bought you bought your priority, but it's in the FAQ. I'm not talking about it just yet. <laughs> well, you never know what, if it might, what might not be in Lost Hedgehog Tales. You never know. <sighs> Don't, don't, no. <laughs> I'm kidding, I'm kidding. Yeah, uh, we'll we'll get there, we'll get there. Just just hold your, hold your horses or whatever animal you want to hold. It's fine. I will say, after the holidays are done and that madness is over with, I'm going to send some feelers out to see if things may have shifted or something so I can finally at least do something. But... 
I can't make any promises. So until then, just hang tight. All right. Next question comes from Ian Waffles. What do you think was the appeal of the Sonic and Sally relationship? Also, correct me if I'm wrong, but it seemed like you changed their romance from an opposite to track dynamic to one where the two cared for each other so much that they could set aside their contrasting personalities and stop bickering. Was this intentional or am I missing the mark? Uh, so right off the bat, they're fun. They're just a fun duo, and it is that opposites attract scenario. All right. Um, we've covered this a few times now that Sally is this, you know, analytical, level-headed, look-before-you-leap type, and Sonic is not. And pairing the two of them together is just a fun dynamic. It's the odd couple scenario. Uh, I wouldn't say that was ever really lost, but it was where they grew from when I picked up the book was a mutual respect. So there would still be the occasional bit of friction between them just because of those wildly different personalities, but they had been through so, so much together and relied on each other in so many scenarios that the friction was lessened. There was a degree of trust between the two of them where, you know, Sally may not like the idea of Sonic going off doing this thing, but nine times out of ten, he's going to come out okay, so she'll trust him. Or you know, Sonic's going... I really don't want to wait. I want to go hit the thing. But Sal says, I need to stop for half a second, so it'll be an eternity. But yeah, all right, I'll wait a minute. And no, so you're not off the mark. It's just that the opposites attract thing wasn't so much dropped as it matured into something more robust. Right. Yeah, I actually, what I kind of liked too was that um, they had, they both had a, a wit to them. You know, it wasn't just Sonic being the witty one. Sally could definitely hold her own. And so I think that's another thing that uh, that really helps their dynamic is that they're kind of on the same level of snarkiness. <laughs> it's just Sally's a bit more of a, a serious most of the time in her personality, but she's also she's got a good deadpan snark thing going on that contrasts really well with Sonic just being like, you know, Sonic. <laughs> mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So, yeah, I like their dynamic too. It's a lot of fun. It's a, it's a good one. Uh, whoever came up with that character should be, uh, should be. Uh, I don't know. Congratulated. Who came up with Sally anyway? Someone at, someone at uh, Deke, I guess. <laughs> well, I, jeez, I don't even know or Sega, where maybe. Sally, as we think of her really kind of settled because she was human at first. Really? Uh, oh, yeah. The, oh, yeah, the, yeah, the, yeah, yeah. You're right. Yep. Like the super, super early development docs had Robotnik as some kind of like Goblin King wizard and <laughs> Sally was Ganon? human. And it was pretty clearly they were writing something else entirely and then Sonic got attached to it and it changed things from there. But <laughs> Wow. Goblin King wizard. Yeah, that is Ganon from the at least from the uh, Zelda cartoon. It's yeah, that's kind of what he is. <laughs> that could have been interesting. Now uh, you're hearing in your head Jaleel White say, "Well, excuse me, princess." <laughs> I'm surprised that line never actually happened. It would have worked. It would have it, it would have absolutely worked. Yep. All right, our next question comes from Koopaling Crew. Without context or any continuity, what would happen if Marine and Sticks got stuck alone on an island meeting for the first time? Marine would be overjoyed to have a new friend. Doesn't matter that she doesn't know her. It's a new friend. And Sticks would be paranoid because who is this person approaching her like she already knows her? Did the man send her? Oh, my God, she already knows her. She must be reading her mind or they have the entire file on her. And so the entire story would be Sticks trying to trap and capture and interrogate Marine and Marine in her way, managing to bumble her way through every single trap and avoid it, only making Sticks more paranoid and frantic. It ends with ice cream. Perfect. <laughs> See, and here I was just thinking, oh, the world would end. <laughs> I, I don't know. <laughs> Want to go that extreme? All right, next question comes from Rael, or R maybe that is it. I can't think of any other way to pronounce it. Rael, I think that's it. Uh, what are your personal thoughts on Eggman's backstory? What do you imagine his family life was like? Was he always evil, or did something cause him to turn? What was he up to before meeting Sonic? That is an interesting question. 
and I've kind of stewed on it here and there, never really in depth because I know Sega would never let me do it. But uh, I don't really know. I, what little we have to go on is he said he always looked up to Professor Gerald. Gerald. But if the arc incident happened 50 years ago and Eggman is at our best estimates in his 40s, I think that's been left as ambiguous now. But at one point he was listed as in his 40s. That timeline doesn't match up. So he couldn't have known Gerald personally. It must have been more of his legacy. And the question there is, what legacy did Gerald leave behind? Did Gunn cover everything up? And so Gerald was remembered as a famed researcher? Or was Gerald blamed for the ARC incident, and so he was seen as a mad scientist? Because that really changes what Eggman's perspective is. If he looked up to Gerald for being a man of science, that is a different motivation than looking up to Gerald for being the mad scientist the entire military had to take down in space. And both of them could be excellent vehicles for his growth. It would just put a very different spin on that narrative. This is also assuming that any of this is going to be remembered or played upon at some point. I'm not holding my breath. Um, in terms of who he was and how he got to be, I, I'm not, I don't know, I'm of two minds on it. Because on the one hand, you don't want to have someone be evil from the get-go because that's boring. But at the same time, I don't want him to be this tragic figure because then people get kind of confused over, oh, well, he really is a good guy. He's just misunderstood. No, 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 no. Eggman is a monster. He's a delightful monster, but he is evil. Yeah. Irredeemably so. So, I don't know. I, I guess I would kind of approach it as someone who was kind of self-centered and selfish from the get-go. But at some point in his life, that became focused to a laser point to get us to the Eggman that we know today. I also really want him to have been a researcher at Gun at some point. Maybe have him be the mind behind all the wacky mech designs. And that's what Gun settled on. He had far wilder ideas, and that's where we get badniks and all the super mechs from. But that's just me theory crafting. All right. And our last priority question this week we had a pretty good uh, pretty good amount of them comes from andrew d in the latest issue when dr starline mentions the warp topaz altering reality were the mushrooms and feathers in the flashback panel appearing as a result of reality altering or were they already there also dr starline mentions that eggman uses the cacophonous conch to control the zeti but in the games it was called the cacophonic conch are they two different names for the same item? Was it purposely renamed? Is it a different item or what? Okay, number one. Yes, that is it altering reality. Starline is talking about it altering reality. That's why there are weird things happening on the apparatus that should not be there. That is the visuals backing up the dialogue to tell the story. How dare they? As, <laughs> as for cacophonous versus cacophonic... That was an oopsie on my part, and nobody caught it. <laughs> Except Andrew. Good job, Andrew. You get the no prize. I actually went back and thought, okay, is this like a you know misunderstanding somewhere, or was it you know called two different things? But no, apparently I got it wrong, and nobody caught it. So, mm. <laughs> <laughs> whoops. Oh well, it happens. All but right. no, it's it's not a new item. It's not a loophole. It's not anything bigger than a typo yay you did it Ian. good job well i try what can i say <laughs> all right let's get into the standard q a first one comes from pc the unicorn i really enjoyed it, the answer you gave about alternative what if scenarios of sonic the hedgehog uh what you would like to do with stories and now i want to actually return to the thing i first referenced in the question about role offering to fight the robot masters would it be a simple one shot or would you have liked like for it to have been a miniseries uh would role have gone by mega woman or another name in what ways would pivotal moments differ from the original such as when role would be fighting proto man before the events of worlds collide along with a showdown at wily castle to stop wily from using gamma uh, <laughs> shrug noise. Um, I hadn't put a lot of thought into it because it was more of a what if scenario. Uh, okay. So how long would it be? I don't know. Depends on 
what Capcom and RG would have allowed at the time. Uh, I don't know if the, what's the word I'm looking for? If the novelty of the uh, alternate timeline would be enough to facilitate a longer narrative, but I don't know. You could get a little bit of mileage out of it. Uh, definitely would have pushed for Mega Woman because the naming conventions are man, woman for full fledged robot masters. Uh, kind of loses the alliteration, but what would you put in its place? You can't really call her Wonder Woman. That's trademarked. Uh, weapon Woman, mm. Warrior Woman. It, it doesn't quite have the same snap mm. to it. No. I'm, what about, like, forgetting. It was in one of the Marvel vs. Capcom games, I think, but I forget what she was called there, but she had like a powered up form. Would it be something like yeah. that? Yeah. But anyway, the, the point would be that in this scenario, she would be the equivalent of Mega Man in his journey. So I would want it to be, you know, clearly this is Mega Woman. This, there is no, uh, you know, there's nothing, there's no caveats to it in this scenario. She takes on the role instead of Rock and does just as well of a job. Uh, how different it would be, I guess, would kind of require us to look into why she took up the mantle instead of Rock and how they approach problem solving differently. Um, just prompted by this question, I was thinking about it, and I would say that you could make the case that Rock is a lab assistant, so he's a troubleshooter. No pun intended. Uh, his programming is meant to be find the error or the problem and eliminate it quickly to get the desired result, leading to his trail of carnage mm -hmm. through all the robot masters. <laughs> Whereas Roll is built more as an assistant, a helper, a cleaner. And so she might have had a more empathetic approach. Um, not quite sure how that would translate into how she would take down the robot masters or how she would confront uh, Proto Man, but it would at least be maybe a different direction to approach things with. If this was a serious investigation, I have not put a lot of thought into it because I'm not writing Mega Man right now. Mm, <laughs> sad face. Anyway, next question comes from Scruffy Matt. About this time last year, we saw the preview for Smash Brothers Ultimate's World of Light. And spent days sobbing into our pillows as we helplessly watched Sonic valiantly trying to save Pikachu, only for them both to be vaporized. A lot of fan art and memes came out of this brief moment, portraying Sonic as having a soft spot for Pikachu and possibly Pokemon in general. So my question is, do you think a Sonic and Pokemon crossover could work? Whether it be a game, movie, comic, or otherwise. And if Sonic were to have a Pokemon of his own, which do you think he would choose? I think folks are screwed Recognizing that a little too closely, Sonic is known for rescuing small animals. Yeah. Pikachu is a small animal. Well, there you go. It's, it's what he do. I mean, it's still a really nice touch. I you know wouldn't have thought of it at first myself, but I really love that they had it in there. It's great. I But I don't think it was like specifically Pikachu, but that's me just being pedantic. No, Samus is the one who has the attachment to Pikachu, not Sonic. Yeah, well, there you go. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I've seen that fan art, too. Um, would a crossover work? I, I guess it could. <laughs> I guess if you threw Eggman into the Pokemon world, it would be pretty, uh, things would change I, pretty quick. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, instead of Pokeballs, he's catching them inside Badnix. There you, you go. Know, the kind of required Ash attempts to catch Sonic thing that, it's been done to death, but I kind of feel like you have to reference it in some yeah, degree. Yeah. Are we talking Ash and Misty and Brock? Are we talking more game centric? Uh, I don't know. There's a lot of questions to be answered there, but I suppose you could make it work. I don't think you could go very far with it. Mm. Maybe a nice little concise mini. Maybe. <laughs> I don't know. Second Nintendo, call me. We'll do lunch. <laughs> if Sonic were a trainer. Am I, am I allowed to make a Sonic you reference on this show? No, you are absolutely not. A, mm -mm, no. Okay. We have to cut no. that out? <laughs> <laughs> no, you keep it in for comedy's sake, but no. That's it. That's okay, as far as we're going. That's all I can say? All right. That's fine. Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> as for Sonic the trainer, uh, assuming he has the patience to raise more than one 
Uh, he probably <laughs> had like an all glass cannon team. Oh, Everyone yeah. with like max speed stats run in, do as much damage as they can, and then that's about it. I feel like Tails would be a better trainer. Oh, yeah, he sure. He'd have like all sorts of, t- he'd like have a Blizzard team set up and know all the min maxing options. And oh, yeah, he'd be <laughs> uh, an incredible uh, trainer. And Knuckles would just like be all the ones that want to punch things. Oh, a pure fighting type. Oh, he yeah. would actively train with them himself. Of course. Yeah. They would be beastly, but, you know, throw in a psychic type and that's about it. Yep. <laughs> uh, yeah. Yeah. Tails would be like to the extreme. <laughs> and finally, our last question comes from James M. Ian, what is worse, being turned into a robot by Zombots or being roboticized in a roboticizer? Uh, it's kind of like asking the question, which is worse, rope burn or sunburn? They both, they suck. both suck. <laughs> okay, good. I'm glad. Although I guess you can't really get cancer thing. from rope burn. Oh, but can you get cancer from being turned into a robot? <laughs> <laughs> I thought that was supposed to cure the cancer. <laughs> um, I guess, I don't know. There's a case for either because being a Robian you have the potential of getting your free will back, but then you're trapped inside this metal shell, fully aware that you're not you, really. Whereas Zombots have no cognizance anymore. They are fully transformed. So is it a mercy that they aren't themselves? Or do they see the world through this kind of distorted lens and they're just trapped watching with no hope of release? It's... They're hmm. both really bad. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, the roboticizer, at least you have to be in a device. Now, if you're free and clear, you all you're doing is looking over your shoulder with the Zombots. You know, anyone can be infected and they can come after you. The trees can infect you. The birds can infect you. The grass can infect you. It's... I, I think the Zombots are worse. <laughs> I suppose you could say that, but only by a small margin. They're both pretty awful. Yeah, well, if you do manage to get your free will back uh, after being put in a roboticizer, uh, you'd at least have, like, I don't know, cool stretchy legs and stretchy arms and super strength and stuff like that. (laughs) So that's 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 an upside. You'd have, like, you know, robot strength and... Be and you'd cool be immune stuff. to the Zombot virus, so there hey, you go. Hey, perfect! <laughs> it works out. <laughs> and you, and you do, Eggman you, comes to him and says, have I got a deal for you? Okay, so this metal virus thing, it's a little too much, but what if I roboticize you? Then you can't be turned into a robot, because you're already a robot. <laughs> Either one kind of sucks. That's like a real Sophie's Choice you got there, Ian. <laughs> uh, I wouldn't go that far. Sophie's Choice is even worse. <laughs> I guess. What, you don't want to decide which of your children you want to die? So that's going to wrap it up to the Q&A. Before we wrap up the show and get Kyle back to his padded cell, we're going to give a big shout out to all the patrons who make this show possible. You guys rock. Thank you for your continued support. Big thank you to Daniel H. Eric F. Connell T. Alex P. Rail 74, Ian Waffles, Eggman Inc., Justin S., Andrew D., Blue Title Gamer, Coupling Crew, Saturn Flicky, Chris A., John B., Jennifer R., Reverend Light, Lisa M., Frederick, Spider Dreamer, Scruffy Matt, PC the Unicorn, Doing This Din, Dave M., Mike B., Samuel P., Sam Cybercat, Digama F., Wow, Brody M., Final Neil, Justin G, Dan M S, Silly String, Takaro, Lee H K, Chevelle, Don B, Sin Fritz, John M, James K, Adam B T, and Overthinking Films. Oh yeah, we had a lot of new names in there. We had a lot of uh, people come on board lately. Thank you. Yeah, well, welcome aboard. Hopefully, kind of I didn't off a little drive bit. I probably should practice for him. Hopefully, I didn't. That's Final Neil. That that caught me off guard. It's like. Final Neil. Final, That's too dramatic a name. Final Neil. Maybe he should be at the end. We'll see. Maybe next time. <laughs> Until that time, Kyle, where can the folks find you? You can find me on Twitter at KyleJCRB. You can also uh, head on over to KNGI.org where you can find archived episodes of the Bumblecast in downloadable MP3 format for your listening pleasure on any device. Uh, you can also find my other show, Nitro Game Injection, which is a video game music show dedicated to awesome 
uh, fan made remixes, arrangements, covers, all that good stuff. Uh, you can listen to that streaming live on Mondays at 7 p.m. Eastern Time or catch it anytime in archive format. Where can people find you, Ian? Head over to BumbleKing.com that has a calendar with a release date for all the stuff that's coming up that I can talk about publicly. FAQs for all sorts of stuff. Uh, my whole portfolio, lots and lots of goodies. Find me on Twitter at Ian Flynn BKC and check out my original webcomic with Sonic veteran Adam Bryce Thomas at Drogoon.com. That's D-R-O-G-U-N-E.com. And you can also follow the show and get all the announcements of when we're doing cool stuff like streaming or recording the show on Twitter at Bumblecast. You can also ask your questions there. Uh, you can also send email to bumblecast.yahoo.com and you can listen to us on Apple Podcasts, Google Play, Spotify, and of course, YouTube. You can support the show by buying yourself some merchandise with a variety of different logos that you can apply yourself. That's shop.spreadshirt.com backslash bundle store. And since we're heading into the holidays, I'm sure they have all sorts of discount codes going on. So you can make sure that we only get a dime instead of a dollar. Go for it. Do it. Do it now. <laughs> Deck your house out in bumble stuff. Do it. <laughs> a very bumble Christmas. Do it. Do it. I dare you. Bumblecast Gaming live streams happen on Twitch at twitch.tv slash bumblecastgaming on Sundays at 10 p.m. Eastern Time, thereabouts, uh, as well as other possible times throughout the week. Keep an eye on Twitter for announcements. We've been a little, uh, it's been a little uh, slow lately with the streaming just because uh, we've both been quite busy. So holidays here for me and, of course, Ian. He's in high demand these days. <laughs> yeah, well, I also got a little carried away last stream and went for three hours. Yeah, yeah, that's, so, uh, that's fine, though. That's fine. Go for no, Kyle, that, that was not fine. My eyes were not fine. <laughs> My back was not fine. <laughs> uh, Deaths okay. were still stranding. It was not fine. I tried to go for like two or three hours just because I'm 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 a nice guy like that. I give the people more than uh, more than they more than they need. No, I'm a wreck. I can't maintain that. That's okay. <laughs> I don't know how I do it, but I do it. So <laughs> here and there, sometimes, sometimes I only play for like an hour. Sometimes it's a game I can beat in an hour, like the one that uh, actually the most recent episode that just came out as we we're recording this was Super Mario Land Two. It's like, yeah, that game's not very long, <laughs> and I'm if pretty sure I beat, beat every level. Yeah. I'm pretty sure I even found all the secret ones. Yeah. That game's, Some of us aren't that good at that, that game, Kyle. That game's really short. I was kind of surprised as I was playing it. I'm like, man, I'm really cruising through this. I'm going to beat it in like an hour. And I'm like, oh, okay, cool. That was a lot easier than I remembered it being back in the day. So <laughs> and I haven't played it in a long time. So I don't know, man. I don't know. I'm not that good at video games, especially nah. new ones. If you see me play Batman, that was terrible. <laughs> as scruffy about me playing Batman Arkham Asylum is embarrassing <laughs> alright that's going to wrap us up for this episode of the Bumblecast we hope you enjoyed we'll see you in a couple weeks for the last episode of 2019 yep and we're it was gracious we're planning on talking about Star Wars I think I believe if we're we going to try we're going to try so. if we get tickets otherwise we have backup plans don't yeah, you worry yes we do we'll be here regardless so uh, we'll see you then toodles I am so bad at Mario games, dude. Like, uh, six golden coins. I could get to Wario sometimes, but I couldn't get past phase one. Mm. He's really... He's a lot easier than I remembered. <laughs> it's like, I went back to it, and I'm like, wow, this is... All these bosses are, like, really easy. What the heck? <laughs> I don't know. They just have really simple patterns, and you just jump on their heads. It's not that bad, but, you know... I get it. I think you're the fake Ian around here. I'm you're comparing yourself to me. Ha! You're not even good enough to be my waffle. Oh no! Not a bad language word. Ah! You've been listening to the Bumblecast, a co-production of Bumble King Comics and the KNGI Network. Original theme music composed by Ken Coda Snyder. Remixed intro by T Lopes. Find out more information, along with podcast feeder links, MP3 downloads, and more at bumbleking.com and kngi.org.
being over at my uh, my grandma's house for the holidays is an interesting uh, experience in what TV is like nowadays. Because I don't have cable. I don't watch TV. <laughs> I right. don't watch. I don't watch normal cable or even over the air TV. Even though I do have an antenna, but um, I it's just like going over there. It's just like wow, this is. It, it and it's funny because it's really clear who they know who still has TV because all the commercials are for like medication, yeah, <laughs> or for yeah, like yeah. if you've been <laughs> so, some in of a the horrible com- accident. A lot of the commercials are like, yeah, have you been in a, like a horrible accident or if you've if you've taken this medication and have suffered something, call this number for <laughs> some lawyers or the. Uh, the standard super happy upbeat commercials that run for like six minutes. Hi there. Do you have this chronic illness? Or, Try blackaflaxin. Yeah, that. Side effects include leg rot, turning into an animal, spontaneous vomiting, third eye, satanic possession. <laughs> Ask your physician if Vavaflav is right for you. I was like, wow, okay, I know who's watching TV, <laughs> who's watching this channel. <laughs> 